thank you all for coming here today. I know you're here to see me and to meet friends. <laughs> we are so delighted to be back in person, and I feel like a majority of the conversations today have been around that. It takes a village is a common phrase that refers to community helping raise a baby. Some incredible people in this room have literally written the book on just this topic. From personal experiences, when it takes a village, the village has helpful hints and great feedback and light suggestions about everything. The leaders in this room have decided to start our own village. We have investors and founders and leaders of the most old school companies around standing together to prove that our way works well. The leaders in this room, oops, sorry, we've const we are constantly evolving and bouncing between thriving and surviving. And this is the time to connect and be a part of something bigger. This is the time that we need to put aside our humble nature and shout from the rooftops about your vision and your passion. This is the time that we need to remind everyone, absolutely everyone, that this is only the beginning. The gap in your resume, the startup that didn't start, the position that you just weren't a good fit for. Let these be the trampolines that get you back up to where you belong. Let the people in this room be the reminder that this too is just a moment in time and we all have something to offer each other. Joining us today are some of the busiest people on the planet who are courageous enough to share their insights into their leadership journey. Leading the conversation of leadership is the managing partner from McKenzie Companies UK, Ireland, and Israel's office, Virginia Simmons. Virginia, thank you so much for joining us. So it's incredible, as I sit here looking out across this room, it's a, a very special feeling. I don't think I've been in a room with this many women for about 18 months, so it's very special. I hope that it's an enjoyable afternoon for you all too. I always get incredible energy from seeing faces like this out there, and apologies to the men, but it is a special day to see <laughs> It's very special for us to see the ladies out there today. So with no further ado, I'm, I'm going to start with a little bit about the introduction. I'm obviously truly honored to be sharing the panel today with three just incredible ladies. And while she doesn't need much introduction, let's be honest, I am going to do a little one. So, Senator Hillary Rodden, Rodden Clinton. We know her for her work as Secretary of State for the US. She was the US Senator from New York. She was prior to that the First Lady of the US, the First Lady of Arkansas, a practicing lawyer, a law professor, an activist, a, a volunteer, and not to mention a mother as well, along the lines, the amazing Chelsea. Uh, we are truly honored to have her here today, and I think more than just the role she's had, it's what she's done with them and the impact she's had. She's been a true pioneer, certainly an inspiration to me, but a pioneer for women's empowerment everywhere, but not just that, also for children, for human rights, for equality, for healthcare, and for inclusion across the board, and so we welcome her. We're delighted to have you with us. And I'm also joined by two female leaders in the UK. First, I, Stephanie Boyce, who was recently this year elected as the president, I believe, the president of the Law Society for England and Wales. She's the 177th president, but she's the first woman of color or black person to do this. And so I think we celebrate that. As I think about what we're going through, there's enormous turmoil in the world, enormous change going on. And I think we've seen several times over the last few months where the law uh, has, the legal profession has stepped in, our judges, our lawyers have stepped in and really studied the ship. And so I think this is a role that has enormous influence. And I personally believe that we're in re really great hands with Stephanie at the leadership. I think she's going to be an enormously positive influence and able to change the systems around us to help things for the better across these communities. So thank you for what you've already done and what we expect from you to do. <laughs> and, then, <laughs> and finally, Claire Barkley. Claire and I have met each other before and had some really fun interactions. She is the CEO of Microsoft UK, but she's also on the board of the CBI, the Confederation of British Industry, where she works with Tony Danker, the Director General there, to really make a difference in UK industry. And she's been trying to help push innovation and really help society and business to really drive the economy. 
She comes from the tech industry, and we all know that the tech industry is not widely known for its uh, gender equality yet, but under Claire's leadership, we hope for more. She's always been passionate about uh, helping both uh, gender and broader diversity and inclusion. She's been very passionate about helping young people in their careers, and she's been part of really driving the industry forward. So we celebrate her, and thank you for being here. And as I look around this room and look at the stage, we've come a long way. You know, it really is different today than it was, but we've still got a long way to go. So the glass, glass is definitely half full, but there's more that we can do. And if we think over the last 18 months, there's been moments where I worry a little bit that we've gone backwards. You know, it's been double duty at home, there's been a lot going on. And so I think today, part of what we have the opportunity to do is say, how do we really take where we were and accelerate forward and keep the best of what we've had over the last 18 months, but really accelerate forward? So I'm hoping that we have a great conversation about that today. So with no further ado, I'm going to start and share a first question. I think my first question is to Stephanie. And so we think about the last 18 months, as we were just talking about. I think that there has been you know, a marked change in what's happened with women. We've had, I think, we did a survey last year that said most women had added 15 hours to their work week with all the domestic duties they were doing. Now, that was most exacerbated when the schools were off and people were at home working, but I'm not sure it's necessarily receded. And as we now go back into hybrid work, I don't know about you, but I'm not finding it particularly easy to add the travel back in and the movement back in and the in-person things back in. It's almost like we had that double duty and then we've just added the other things back in. So given that, Stephanie, how would you suggest women pivot what they do and how they work in order to keep the very best of what we had, but really manage it in this new hybrid world? Well, can I first say, uh, I'm absolutely delighted to be in such esteemed company. Um, so grateful to be here. Um, so over the past few years, the Law Society has built in, uh, been building a stock of uh, information on women's experiences through, uh, and I see some of you nodding your head, uh, through our uh, Women in Leadership in Law programme, and that was previously headed up by our former president, Christina Blacklaws, who uh, did great work uh, around uh, uh, gender uh, equality in the profession. And we did this through roundtable surveys, uh, uh, conferences, and, and a final symposium uh, where we launched our Women in Law pledge. Um, but uh, the key obstacles that all of that, the culmination of all of that work highlighted, the key obstacles to women's progression uh, was unconscious bias. Um, uh, uh, you know, to women progressing in the legal sector. Um, and the unacceptable work-life balance that, was, uh, uh, that came out in that, uh, in that survey. And so the last 18 months or so has seen, seen a shift in the way we work from office to home. Um, but what we haven't really had is true flexible working. Um, uh, and it's that flexibility that seems to uh, uh, have, that women have borne the brunt of. And of course, you mentioned, Virginia, about you know, the added responsibility, caring responsibility, uh, 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 homeschooling uh, as we have uh, uh, faced successive lockdowns. Um, so flexible working was often cited as the linchpin to improving gender balance, that if we have true flexibility, that would improve, improve uh, uh, women's um, progression, career progression. Um, but flexibility is important. Um, and of course, a survey by the Next 100 Years Project um, uh, uh, found that nine out of 10 women uh, said that you know, the pandemic had uh, unduly influenced them. 70% 70 70 of those, those surveyed said that, um, uh, that you know, they had borne the brunt, as I say, of um, childcare and responsibilities. But most of those surveyed were very positive about what their organizations were doing for them. Um, but it's important in those discussions that men are part of that discussion. We can't have those discussions in absence of men um, and men uh, champion, championing women's progression. So just to give you a few statistics, 52% of, uh, uh, of our profession, practicing profession, is c are currently women. 63% um, uh, at entry. Um, and what we're seeing at entry level, uh, that women are doing quite well, but like most of the legal profession, that as you move up into the senior rungs of the profession, uh, uh, there is an absence there. You know, 31% of uh, partners in private practice are female. You know, so 52%, 31% private practice. 
Um, so there is more to be done, um, and we must continue to advocate, we must continue to highlight uh, these areas that need improvement. Um, and as I say, men are an important part of that discussion um, and the work towards achieving, achieving true parity um, uh, as we progress, as women progress um, up the ladder. Thank you. Actually, picking up on your point around this progression, we do have more industry now that has more parity at the entry level. But our recent research showed that there's a broken rung on the ladder. And I personally expected it to be a rung fairly close to the top, but it turns out it's not. It's actually the first rung on the ladder. And it's the degree to which you, women get to that first rung. So let's say you took 100 men who got to that first rung, who got promoted to the first level of management or hired in at that level. You'd have only 72 women, and only 58 would be women of color. And so you can see those ratios. And we found many reasons for that. Um, are all and many things around how they get uh, sponsored by people, how they get the special projects that give them stretch, how they get time outside. But I think you know, one of the things that we could all collectively do is think about how do we change the systems so that we can actually help women, give women a fair shake. So if I turn to you, Hillary, what would you like us to be doing as women leaders around the room to change the system to give everyone equal opportunity? Well, first of all, thank you very much to Accelerate Her. Um, I love the title. And I was privileged to be part of the virtual uh, event last year. And it's just great being back in London to be here in person uh, as part of this today. I think that you have to look, and, and Stephanie alluded to this, there are attitudinal problems that are not going to go away unless they are called out and unless they are changed. And that is closely linked to the institutional changes that are required. So let's look at sort of both of those categories. Um, and it reminds me when Virginia was speaking about what happens on the rung of a really interesting analysis that was done by a big tech company, Salesforce. And back, you know, we now speak BP and AP, before the pandemic, um, the uh, Salesforce uh, founder, CEO, uh, Mark Benioff, had been reading, he's a friend of mine, he'd been reading about all this uh, bias, and he kept saying to me and to others, well, that may be happening elsewhere, but it doesn't happen in my company. And I said, well, how do you know, Mark? <laughs> And he goes, well, because we talk about it all the time and we have all kinds of programs. And then he decided, and good for him, that he would do an analysis. Maybe he hired McKenzie, I don't know. But in any event, <laughs> he did an analysis and here is what he found. On entry, women and men, new hires, are equivalent in education and experience, whether they are straight out of college, out of graduate school out of a prior employment, they start off on a very even playing field. But it does not take long before men are climbing the ladder at a much more rapid pace than their women colleagues. And what he found is exactly what Stephanie said. It's unconscious bias, sometimes called implicit bias. And literally, you can take CEOs and other managers, and I guarantee you they will pass a lie detector test <laughs> if asked, do you practice unconscious bias or implicit bias? They will say no, and the needle will not move because they <laughs> truly believe they do not. But if you unpack it, it is the expectations, literally the pictures you live with in your head, the stereotypes that you have about appropriate behavior between men and women. Because the double standard is alive and well. And so when Mark and the Salesforce team began to really try to dig into this, you know, they found things like, well, you know, he's such an active engager in meetings, and he's always speaking up, and he always has something to say. And of course, that sends off an alarm to any woman who's ever been in a meeting. Because, <laughs> I don't know about you, but I've been in a million of them. And when I first started my career, it was that same story. I'd say something, conversation would move on. One of my male colleagues would say something. People would say, well, that's a really good idea. <laughs> and so, of course, now, if a woman in any meeting that I'm in anywhere says anything, I say, that's a really good idea. Um, 
but part of it is the unconscious attitudes that we all bring to life, not just to work. I'll, and I want to just tell a quick story before I go into institutional. I'm probably the oldest person in this room looking around at all these very young people. <laughs> and so when I was a young lawyer, Stephanie, and I was um, you know, looking for how you're supposed to behave as a young lawyer back in the 1970s, we all wore, not all of us, but most of us, most of the time, wore little navy blue skirt suits with white blouses and sometimes a ribbon tied around our neck <laughs> to mimic a man's necktie. Oh. And there was so much advice for how you were supposed to behave in the workforce. And I remember reading an advice column. And here was the question. Dear, as I remember the man's name was John uh, Malloy, I think his name was. He was the advice columnist. Dear John Malloy, I'm about to be promoted. So for the first time, I will have a private office. I want to know how should I decorate it? What should I put in it? Here was the answer. I can't tell from your initials whether you're a man or a woman. If you're a man, put family pictures in your office because that will show you're a reliable worker, that you're working to support your family, and that will give you points. If you're a woman, keep those pictures out of your office because people will think you can't concentrate on work. Now, that was not the dark ages. It wasn't that long ago. But think about what that tells you about the biases that people bring. So that brings me to institutional change. So what Salesforce did was to try to make explicit all these biases and to literally require managers to ask themselves, OK, when I say he's ambitious, that's a compliment. When I say she's ambitious, that's not. Start thinking about how you think about your employees. If it's a young mother and she is willing to work as long hours and as hard as possible, but her baby gets sick and her babysitter doesn't show up, do I penalize her when the father goes to work because somebody else is left to take care of that little sick baby? Start thinking about all those extraneous biases in an institutional way and begin to change how employees are hired, how they are retained, how they are promoted, all of those pieces. And of course, in the larger world, there are so many institutional biases against women, particularly women with children. And we saw all of that during the pandemic, as Virginia was saying, how more women had to leave the workforce. More women in my country were doing double, triple duty, no childcare, no schools open. For single mothers who had cobbled together working arrangements, it was a total disaster. Now trying to get back into the workforce, there is still so much uncertainty that there is still a lot of uh, institutional barriers for women coming back. So this is not just in your mind, this is real. And you have to also think about how you are being perceived and try to preempt it or try to deflect it uh, if you can so that you don't get you know, sort of disadvantaged by either the uh, unconscious implicit bias or the institutional arrangements that make it more difficult for women at any age to succeed. Thank you. Claire, similar question for you. Yes, thank you. <laughs> totally agree. <laughs> You're in a great position leading an incredible company, and so have the opportunity to change some of this. And as I think about what Secretary Clinton was talking about in terms of some of the workforce changes, mm. I think it's something like 38, 40% of the workforce is women, and yet 54% of the job losses through COVID were women. And yet we know for sure there's plenty of research to say diverse companies with women at the top actually perform better. Mm. I think it's like 25% better, and I actually think women with diverse cultural groups perform 35% better, ethnicities and so on. So given that you know, corporate, private environment, what is it that you think that we could all do to make the environment better, to help make these changes come to fruition? Um, so firstly, it's wonderful, wonderful to be here with so many uh, people. But you know, um, obviously I welcome all the women that are here, but I also give a massive shout out to the men that are here. Right. 
um, because if I think back on uh, you know a bit of my career, certainly the last eighteen months, um, you know I was appointed as a CEO a year ago. Um, nothing like being appointed in the middle of a pandemic. Um, I have two uh, relatively young sons, 14 and 10. Um, so a lot of the analogies that Hillary has mentioned around, you know, take on a CEO job at Microsoft UK, and uh, by the way, no teaching and how do you take care of kids and all the rest of it, I ha have a lot of empathy for that. But actually, as I reflect on um, some of the experiences within my career, I do think there's something about allies and sponsors mm. that has been extremely important. Um, and uh, the most recent one was a female sponsor, but actually if I think about the thread in my career, it's amazing men that have actually, I think someone um, used the word trampoline, you know, trampoline earlier on, something about the confidence uh, that they had given me. I was, um, you know, very early in my career um, when I joined Microsoft. Um, and so I was reflecting, just listening to the other speakers around, well, what is it that makes the rung of like, my step up different to others? What, what made me different to that? And then how do I take that now in my position and say, well, what can I do uh, to provide a lift and a, and a trampoline to others? But I, I do feel like um, the, the male allies and sponsors that basically said, like, you can do it, push, do it, um, were very important. So I just thought I would, uh, I would reflect on that just before I answer the question. I think in terms of, I mean, listen, running uh, tech is, I'm sure we'll get into this later, but tech, the tech industry is notoriously bad uh, for, uh, for diversity. And I think actually the story that Hillary told of, of Mark Benioff and Salesforce, that's sort of replicated across the whole, the whole of the industry. Um, and actually, if you look, just if we anchor it down from a UK standpoint, there are still 20% of companies that don't uh, report their uh, gender diversity and the gender pay cap, pay cap reporting. So it's kind of a... Well, maybe if I just sweep that under the carpet, maybe it won't go away. Maybe it's too hard. Maybe they don't know what to do. Um, now, that sounds all negative. I do see a movement of change, though. I see this movement of optimism uh, coming. Um, and I think many employees, certainly younger employees now, they don't accept that companies will not do something about this. They consider it their right um, of all diversity and inclusion. But I think for young women coming through, uh, the workplace. I feel I saw some of the young children, people on maternity leave coming back. You know, you feel this hope for the future um, in terms of what's going forward. I, there's a couple of things um, uh, that we have driven hard within Microsoft um, that I thought might be worth sharing. There's actually some similarities in some of the examples that Hillary has given about what Salesforce do, but I'll, I'll share a few. Um, if I think about all forms of diversity and inclusion, we have a phrase at Microsoft UK, which is about come as you are, do what you love. We want to celebrate everyone for being really the, them, their true selves. Um, but if I think I'm, I think I'm a reasonable expert on what it's like to be a woman, but many of our other inclusion groups, like I feel like a, an enthusiastic amateur. And so uh, one of the things I've personally benefited, benefited from from a leader is being good at really, really listening, being okay at making mistakes when you try a few things on diversity groups that you don't uh, know about. Because I think the intersectionality of how you might think about um, you know, black and Asians in the workplace, um, military in the workplace, accessibility in the workplace, they all intersect with the, the agenda of women to make sure that you can make it whatever woman you are, you can be embraced within the workplace. And I found those groups at Microsoft to be a, like a superpower um, you know, we had a, a, a situation that many of you, if you live in London, will be aware of when Sarah Everard was murdered in London. That had a very big impact on the, uh, the women uh, resource group. Um, and I found them to be a great coach to me on the way to deal with that situation. What is it that matters? What do I do next, etc. So those, the, those, those resource groups um, are a superpower. And then the second thing um, that we're working hard on, I think... Um, uh, uh, Hillary, you referenced about um, we talk about it a lot. That's very common in a lot of companies that are sort of waking up to this. There's a lot of talk, but often there's not a lot of action. And so um, you can feel really good as a leader that you're talking about it, you're getting groups, but if nothing changes, then it, it's all pointless. <laughs> like nothing's actually made progress. So not only have we been, we focus very hard on the things that really make a difference, like what are we actually going to achieve, and both in soft and hard measures, how do we hold ourselves to account uh, in making progress? Um, we have put a very strong focus on improving representation in the tech industry. It's really hard because there's not many out there, 
Um, you've got to start at a very young age and you have to be very purposeful, almost biased in your hiring because you won't find them otherwise. Um, and you have to, every woman has to count, you know, you lose one, you have to be uh, devastated at the loss of one and go find another two, three, mm. because every single one makes a really big difference. Um, in the last four years, uh, we've increased our female representation by 8%. Now that may seem like, wow, it's only 8%, and sometimes I think, God, that's just not enough. Um, but every percentage makes a significant difference, um, and we are improving uh, the level of rep representation in more senior roles. Um, and I feel like if I can be a role model on, on some of that stuff uh, from above, then actually that will take action. But I think some of the small things we do, like we have a wonderful program uh, called Digi Girls, and so this is for girls of 10 to 14 about, well, why would you choose to work in technology? Um, and we've, um, we've reached about a million of those young, amazing, young things that are kind of like, wow, is there really a job in technology? So there's a few things like that, but again, it's measurement. And I, feel, I just feel optimistic for how things are going to go forward, but it's not an easy path, and every action that every leader takes makes a difference. Thank you. Stephanie, Hillary, anything to add on that one? What can we do to help women really step up in this environment, or what companies can do? Well, I think visibility, um, if I may, Hillary. <laughs> um, <coughs> I think, well, I know visibility is uh, a key aspect of that. You know, one of the things I said, um, uh, you know, in taking up this role was that I was going to be visible, take the Law Society to places it's never been. Um, you know, if people can see it, they can be it, they can achieve it. Um, and going back from, you know, young children um, and our hopes and dreams and aspirations for our youngsters. Um, and, you know, that is why I think, you know, all of us, you know, and all of us in this room are committed to change, to build in a, a better world and, and making, you know, making things, uh, making things different um, and to change the narrative, uh, you know, and, and that was one of the reasons that drove me, you know, in my attempts to occupy this position and, you know, um, and if I ever write a book, I think I will call it four times um, because <laughs> that's, the, that's the number of attempts it took me to be successfully elected uh, uh, into this role. Um, so it's one about, you know, determination, resilience, and never giving up. So maybe I pivot a little now, and we hear a little few more personal stories. And thinking about, none of you went into, you know, the law, I'm an engineer, technology. None of them are known for their, you know, being dominated by women. So I'd love to hear a bit about what drew you to that field in the first place. Maybe, Hilary, if we start with you. Well, I, um, I was drawn to uh, the law <clears throat> because I, I uh, wanted to be active in uh, making change, making policy differences, you know, dealing with uh, inequality and injustice. And I was very fortunate um, that I began to meet or hear about uh, some uh, lawyers, both men and women, who provided a lot of uh, role modeling uh, for me. And probably the most important uh, is a woman uh, named Marion Wright Edelman, an African-American um, lawyer who had also gone to Yale Law School about 10, 12 years before me. And she became the first black woman uh, to pass the Mississippi Bar in the height of the Civil Rights Movement. And I read about her, and um, I really was impressed. And it so happened my very you know, first month or two at Yale, uh, I read, uh, and this was you know, way before uh, technology. And so we had, I'm sure none of you have heard of this, a bulletin board. <laughs> and on the bulletin board were notices. And I was looking at the bulletin board one day, and there was a notice that Marion Wright Edelman uh, was going to be on campus, so I went to hear her speak. And her passion, her commitment, uh, she had been a close um, colleague of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. She had worked in one of the very first programs to alleviate child poverty called Head Start. Uh, and tried to start those programs throughout one of the poorest parts of the United States. So after, um, after I heard her speak, I went up to her, and she was starting a program called the Children's Defense Fund. 
so I asked her if I could uh, work for her that summer after my first year of law school. She said, you can, but I can't pay you. And that was a problem because I, had, I was putting myself through law school. But I figured out a way to get a fellowship, and I went to work for her. And uh, it really uh, was one of the most important experiences in my life because it showed me what I wanted to do with the law. And as Virginia said, I've done a lot of things. I've been a, you know, an advocate using the law to make legislative and regulatory changes. And I've practiced law and I've taught law. And I just thought it was such a tremendous opportunity to almost have a continuing education. You never know what problems your clients are going to uh, come to you with. Uh, you, you never know when your legal education and skills and experience will come in handy. So it turned out to be uh, an, excellent, um, uh, an excellent continuing education and profession. And unlike Stephanie, I'm a recovering lawyer. Uh, <laughs> I, do, I don't do much practice other than, you know, try to advise anybody I can find to do something better than they're doing it. But other than that... It's uh, it still is something that I, I take very great pride in and really you know uh, got a lot out of over all those years. Thank you, Stephanie. How about for you? Well, you know I grew up uh, in a household where you know uh, was very much exposed to what was going on domestically and globally. I could see injustices unfolding uh, around the world. Um, you know, at the age of twelve, I went to live in a, uh, in America. Um, and it's fair to say that, you know, America would have a lasting impression upon me. Um, you know, I was plucked from rural Buckinghamshire, uh, taken to uh, America, um, and I was overwhelmed uh, by uh, instances of poverty, um, by people struggling to exercise their rights, uh, people having little or no rights because of the colour of their skin. Um, and I wanted to make a difference, to, to, to have or, or help people um, have their, voice heard, their voices heard. Um, and so uh, a few days after graduating from uh, high school, uh, I was back on the plane uh, to this jurisdiction because this is where I wanted to study law. I am an absolute proponent of uh, access to justice, um, you know, because for me, legal rights mean absolutely nothing if you don't know when those rights are being taken away or you cannot enforce those rights. Um, and that's why it's absolutely important uh, that you know, we, we ensure uh, as lawyers, um, and that perhaps is why I, I still practice um, uh, when I can, is that you know, at the heart of being a solicitor um, uh, you know, in this jurisdiction, because um, we're not a fused pro uh, profession at the moment, um, but at the heart of being a solicitor is we are dispute resolvers. We help people to understand their rights and obligations uh, to seek advice. Um, uh, and, and that's what absolutely drives me, um, day in, day out. Um, and I'm absolutely honoured and privileged to uh, lead uh, the, the solicitor profession, some 200,000 solicitors in this jurisdiction of England and Wales. Wonderful, thank you. Claire, yours is different. Yeah, Technology. It is different. How did you get into it? It's very inspiring. I, I mean, and why? I, I'm not sure, like, I mean, Hillary and Stephanie chose this profession. I'm not sure <laughs> I chose technology. I think technology found me. I, um, I had a, a very, um, very strong, um, independent mother, um, and I had a father that told me that I could achieve anything. And I started in the world of technology, um, and I... I became excited by this world of technology because I believed, even back, you know, over 25 years ago, I believed that technology had the opportunity to change the world. Um, and uh, I could also explain, you know, when I chose Microsoft as a company, I could explain it to my parents. That was another criteria. I was like, you know, <laughs> easy to explain. Um, but actually, if I think of the things that, um, you know, technology can empower in lives, I mean, Hillary talks about bulletin boards, and you think about the world of communication, and how would we be able to survive, you know, the last 18 months, the, the importance that technology uh, played in keeping society um, and the world moving. And then I, I think about just the opportunity that that represents. I was, uh, it was a very male-dominated uh, world back then, and it still is. Um, but in some ways, maybe maybe through the, the will of my parents and my determination, etc., I felt like, well, 
I can be something different in this industry. I think I can make a difference in this industry. Um, and that's sort of what's fueled me on. And if I think about, um, you know, the, an interesting t statistic by 2025, there'll be about 440,000 jobs that will be unfilled in this sector. Um, so actually, as the world is changing, um, I think there's an amazing opportunity for young people of all uh, colours, backgrounds, um, and all, all shapes of society to actually participate in that. Um, and I think for those of you that may have been reading the papers over the weekend, not only if you think about the, um, what, how important technology was in the discovery of the vaccine and improvements in clinical trials and all the rest of it, it will play a critical role in really important societal issues such as carbon capture and uh, the important breakthroughs we need to make on sustainability. And then I read the, in the paper at the weekend just the early progress that the NHS are about to make on uh, early detection of cancer through blood testing. And all of that is being made possible because of this speed of technology. And so I sort of feel proud that I chose it for wanting to make a difference many years ago and I couldn't, I'm very inspired about what I think it can do for the world at large uh, going forward. Yeah, there's plenty of opportunity to go, isn't there? Yeah, absolutely. And maybe just going one level further into each of this, you've all been successful in what you chose to do, which is a very fortunate position to find yourself in, but I'm sure it wasn't a straight line. I'm sure there were, you know, zigzags in the road and moments where you had to overcome something. I wonder if you could share with us what was a crucible moment for you and what did you do about it, particularly if it was concerned with some of the unconscious bias that you were facing? Maybe, Hillary, if you share one with us. Well, I, I was just thinking um, about um, when I uh, was making the decision about where to go to law school, because I had applied to several, and I narrowed it down to going either to Harvard or to Yale. And I had a friend who invited me to come to the Harvard Law School which was having a kind of a cocktail reception for admitted students. And so I took him up on his offer and I, I went to the reception and there were faculty there and this friend of mine was taking me around introducing me. And there was a very formidable, very well-known professor, if any of you have ever seen the movie Paper Chase, he mm. looked just like that. Very big, three-piece suit, watch chain, just very imposing. So my friend is, you know, very happily introducing me. He takes me up to this professor and he goes, oh, professor so-and-so, this is Hillary Rodham and she's trying to decide between us and our closest competitor. And this man looks down at me and he says, first of all, we don't have a closest competitor. <laughs> and secondly, we don't need any more women. Ooh. So that, that's why I went to Yale. <laughs> but I mean, you, you cannot, I mean, we talk about implicit unconscious bias. I came of age when it was explicit and <laughs> conscious and often verbalized in extremely uncomfortable uh, fashion. Uh, and when I used to try cases, when I was a, a, what you would say is a barrister, when I was a trial lawyer, um, I would go into all these courthouses around Arkansas uh, which is where I was living and practicing. And honestly, I remember this is the last story I will tell because it's kind of funny, although it's quite weird. I was trying a lawsuit in North Arkansas in a town called Batesville, and it was like a three-day trial. And so like the second day, uh, we come back after lunch, and sitting in the front row of this little courtroom were about four men dressed in camouflage. And I said to the bailiff, I said, who are they? And they said, oh, uh, you know, they, they live around here and, and it's deer season, so they're out in, uh, out in the woods hunting deer and they came in for supplies and somebody told them there was a lady lawyer at the courthouse, wow. so they just came to watch. <laughs> I mean, you, when, when, you know, so I know how sometimes young people, particularly younger women, get a little impatient at the pace of change. You cannot imagine what it looks like <laughs> from my perspective. It is the glass half full for sure. It means you still have to keep working at it. But there, are, there were so many uh, instances where clients, adversaries, even 
when I was teaching law, I was very young at that point, and some of my students, some of my male students were older and they'd been in Vietnam, and they were just not interested in having a woman professor. And they would say that, say, well, you know, you don't have anything to teach me. I said, well, how do you know? And it was, you know, so you just have to constantly be, I think, um, you know, what both Claire and Stephanie said, you just have to constantly be both determined and resilient because you will get knocked down, even if it's done with a smile instead of a sneer. And you will have to get back up. And that's really the difference between people who keep going and achieve some measure of success and fulfill their dreams and people who get discouraged, depressed, give up, get bitter, you know, you just have to laugh about it a lot of the times and then figure out different strategies to go right back at it. Thank you. Claire, how about you? Um, yeah, I think that there's something, the, the, the resilience side of it. So I, I definitely, my biggest setback in earlier in my career, I was um, in my mid-twenties, I think it was, and um, I had all male management, as you would do at that time. <laughs> Um, and uh, one day I got called into the office by the, uh, the manager at the time, and he said, I'd only been with the company about three months, and um, he said, unfortunately, we're going to have to let you go. Like, there was no reason for it, and they just said, like, we're having to, we've decided we're going to scale back or whatever, and you know that feeling where you think, wow, I thought I was getting somewhere, and, um, uh, you know, at that moment, I was like, I will not cry in this meeting, I will not cry, <laughs> so I, uh, which I managed to keep it together. And, um, uh, and I went home and I thought, well, what am I going to do about this? And I, that feeling of, like, pick yourself back up really resonates with me because I thought, listen, I can be all down about this or I can just pick myself back up. So I immediately started to look for another role or whatever. And there was about a week later, same manager calls me back into the office because obviously I am just now focusing on taking care of myself and uh, moving forward. And he was like, we've made really a bad mistake. <laughs> um, you know, we've seen the way that you respond and, you know, and we'd really like to keep you. And I, you know, that moment I was kind of like, oh, so, <laughs> so but I was at that stage of my career where I was like, I really need the experience. Um, um, so I stayed for a period longer, but literally the next day he got rid of the girl that sat next to me. So it just, it was this lesson for me around, wow, I mean, you will face adversary uh, experiences in life and you've got to figure out how to do that. I stayed for the minimum amount of time that I could before I thought I need to get out of here. Um, and actually that was my segue into, into Microsoft. So that was the, that was the story. Um, and maybe just one other one later in my career, I, I, I um, eventually got um, appointed to the board. So it was the first time um, I, I got a leadership job. I was terrified and I had a big feeling of imposter syndrome. Like, can I, can I do this? It was mainly men, experienced men um, on that team at the time. And the guy that was uh, leading uh, the UK at the time could feel um, that somehow my shoulders were hunched. Mm. Um, and he said, I feel like you've got the world of the weight on your shoulders. I just want to remind you um, that I hired you for you. So let your shoulders go. <laughs> Be yourself. Because if you can bring your whole self, um, then the impact and the inspiration you will bring to others will unlock you know, magnificent things in the future. And so if I wanted a good story and a bad story, That's uh, he was a very inspiring leader, so. And Stephanie, I can't imagine you've faced any challenges, but just in <laughs> no. case you have. Not at all, <laughs> four times. Uh, so. What were the crucible moments for you? Um, I think there are many. You know, I'm, I'm first generation uh, British. Um, you know, I grew up in a single parent household on a council estate. People ask me all the time, why do you tell that story? Um, but, well, firstly, that is my history or her story. That's, you know, and I'm not embarrassed. I'm not ashamed. You know, this is who I am. Um, and I come from a long lasting legacy. You know, my grandfather uh, and, and parents, my grandparents and parents come into this country. Um, I say, they say, in search of faith, hope, and greater opportunities. My grandfather was illiterate. He told us we were to make something of ourselves. He never said what. Um, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and I hope that I've honoured that legacy. Um, but of course I have faced uh, uh, discrimination. Of course I have faced uh, uh, obstacles. Um, but, uh, you know, but for every knockdown, for me, the lesson wasn't in how many times I got knocked down. Four times. The lesson was in Not how counted. did I get up? You know, the stories, the ability to refine, to hone, to learn those skills. 
Um, and I'm not a, a person who, uh, I run, uh, you know, I tell people all the time, run your own race, you know, tell your own story. Because if I listen to the people who said, we will, you know, um, uh, uh, four times, Stephanie, you're embarrassing yourself, go home and rest. <laughs> You know, never in our lifetime will we see an ethnic minority or a person of colour become president of the Law Society. Um, you know, um, I would never be here. But the most important thing is get into action. This did not come to me, sat at home, uh, waiting for it to land in my lap. You know, you have to get out. Um, and if opportunities uh, uh, don't present themselves, then, you know, make one. I wanted to be the CEO of my own company, so I created my own company. You know, uh, uh, make the opportunities and just go for it. Do it. Yeah. <laughs> Could I just one th one point uh, that both both Stephanie and uh, Claire have made, which I think is really important to underscore. And I think I think it was Claire who said the imposter syndrome. How many of yeah. you have heard of the imposter syndrome? Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, everybody should hear of it, particularly every young woman, because it is one of the biggest obstacles to getting yourself back up feeling you're worthy and still going on. Because if you don't think you're qualified, you don't think you're ready, um, those shoulders go up. And, you know, that anxiety takes over. And it is something that I, I've hired, you know, many people over the course of, you know, my various uh, careers and positions. And it's almost inevitable. If I go to a young woman and say, I'd like to add more responsibility, or I think you should try this job, or I think you're ready for that. Invariably, she will say, do you think I'm ready? <laughs> if I go to a young man, because I've hired a lot and promoted a lot of young men, and I say the same thing, it's like, what took you so long? <laughs> and I say that because it's a really gender-linked <laughs> problem in my experience and in reading the literature that too many young women have what I call the perfectionist gene, not the good enough gene, the perfectionist gene. <laughs> and if you're not perfect, you somehow feel you're not ready or you're not worthy or you're not qualified. You gotta get over that and get over it as you know, quickly as you can because it's a real impediment uh, to feeling your own power, your own worth and being able to claim that. That's a great segue into our final question. So this one to Claire. If you think about the room we've got and you think about your younger self, but your younger self in today's world, what advice would you give? Um, well, I mean, firstly, I, mean, I think for all the people here, I mean, what opportunity these amazing young people have in front of them. But I think that there's something for me about just being yourself and be comfortable and believe in the amazing person that you are. Because I think if you believe that, then anything's possible. Thank you. Stephanie. <laughs> I agree with that. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, my advice is you are stronger than you know. Um, and that, you know, every door is open if you push, you persevere until something happens. And finally, Hillary. I, I mean, it, it may sound, you know, sort of predictable because we're all basically saying the same thing. But these are some of the hardest lessons to learn and believe and hang on to internally. Never to give up. If you want something, you've got to prepare for it. You often have to prepare more than somebody else in order to be even considered. But keep going, no matter what the obstacles or the setbacks. Um, and to my younger self, I would say, I don't know what's going to happen to you. Um, <laughs> so just be prepared. <laughs> and, and, you know, have a good time doing it, whatever it is, because life is so uncertain in today's world, thanks in part to technology and everything that's going on. You have no idea what might be possible for you. I never thought I would run for political office. I certainly never thought I would run for president. And I've run twice. I'm listening. To <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, I, time to move on. But I think it is, it, it is, you know, it is unpredictable. Sitting here today, I would be really surprised if 
most of you, if any of you, knew exactly what you'd be doing in 10 years or 20 years or 30 years. And just stay open and just, you know, enjoy the ride. Thank you. I just want to, uh, I want to say a, a huge thank you to our panelists. And also, since you referred to it, I spent the last 15 years in the US and I have a 12 year old daughter who had a bird's eye seat to everything that was going on. We lived in Chicago, which was at the center of some of it. And my daughter would now like to run for president because of you. So for that, I say thank you. <laughs> I'd just like to say thank you all again for joining us today. It's been a fun and candid conversation. I think that's what we all could use right now. I agree we should be our own, our own biggest fans. There's enough people in the world that are trying to push us down. So remind ourselves, get rid of the imposter syndrome and stand up for yourself. Let's do one more round of applause and I'll escort these ladies out.